All right. Um, as I've already mentioned, our theme this semester is women and politics. And sometimes, a number of the presentations we're going to have during the semester are very much focused on what we might think of as formal politics, right? The involvement of women in political office, for example. Um, but we also, at times, will interpret this more broadly uh, to mean something like uh, women in society or women and power, right? And today's presentation falls under this broader understanding of our theme. Uh, many of you probably know that in the academy, we often refer to academic politics. And in fact, we're interested in exploring part of that today as it pertains to the role of women's studies and that of women faculty and administrators here at BYU. Now, I'm going to introduce our three speakers here in the order in which they will address us. Um, they will each address us briefly, and then following all three, we'll have uh, a Q&A uh, session um, until our time runs out. Now, I'm going to introduce them briefly um, without, for example, detailing their numerous publications. But just know of that all of them are accomplished and impressive uh, scholars, and I'm sure that will all come through in their remarks. First, we will hear from uh, Amy Harris, who is an associate professor of history at BYU. Her research interests center, of, uh, center on families, women, and gender in early modern Britain, and she's particularly interested in the way family and social relationships inform one another. Second, Connie Lamb will talk to us. She is a senior librarian at the uh, Harold B. Lee Library. For our purposes, it's important to note that she's the women's studies librarian, but she also oversees anthropology, Middle Eastern studies, and among other things. Then we will hear uh, third from Valerie Hegstrom, who is professor of Spanish and Portuguese as well as the coordinator of our global women's studies program at BYU. I will just mention um, briefly that she is the recipient this year of the P.A. Christensen Lectureship uh, in the College of Humanities, which recognizes a career achievement in important scholarship in literature. Um, and so that, I think, is also worth noting. So after, as I mentioned, following their presentations, we will have uh, a Q&A for as long as time allows. I'll talk about that when we get to that point. So um, Amy, thanks. Um, so I'm going to do a rather fast survey of two things. One, the presence of female faculty at BYU, and then the physical mem um, mem commemoration of women at BYU. So they didn't tell me how they're going to click through the PowerPoint for me, who the magical wizard is. Oh, thank you. Okay. So these are just some early photos of, and I don't know if we can turn some of the front lights down. Um, some of the early photos just of uh, students at BYU. So women have always been at BYU. There wasn't a phase where they weren't here studying and teaching. So you can see in the pictures with Carl Mazur, early female faculty from the very beginning. Um, uh, this, I don't know if this, this is the complete faculty from 1913, uh, but there's about 1,500 faculty now, so we've grown a little bit. But there's, uh, you get a sense, there's uh, six women in that picture a little under a quarter of the people in the picture. I want to start, though, mostly with Alice Louise Reynolds. Um, she entered BYU Academy to receive a normal diploma, which is a teaching degree in 1890, and a bachelor's of pedagogy in 1895. She studied University of Michigan, took classes in Chicago, Cornell, Berkeley, uh, and in London and Paris, all to improve her teaching of English and literature. She received a Bachelor of Arts from BYU once it became BYU instead of BYU Academy in 1910. She taught English at BYU from 1894 to 1938. That's big changes she would have overseen. She was awarded full professorship in 1911, the second woman in Utah to attain that status. But her real contribution to BYU is in the library. Um, uh, well, her lasting contribution that we encounter, she's made a contribution, of course, to the English department. Uh, she was the faculty library committee chair for 19 years, and for those of you who aren't professors, no one wants to be the chair of any committee for 19 years. <laughs> um, she was the driving force for the growth of the library, and by the time of her death, there was 100,000 volumes that had come into the library because of her. 
I'll just say my personal preference would be the library to be named for her. Um, but I don't, I don't see that happening. Um, um, so she was active in other civic and community affairs, served in uh, general positions in the LDS Church, was editor of the Relief Society magazine for seven years, in addition to all of her faculty and campus responsibility. Her former students formed the Alice Louise Reynolds Club. It eventually grew to 16 chapters throughout the US, and they, um, they met regularly, and as that sort of wound down, they were instrumental for the endowment of the annual Alice Reynolds Lecture that is still held in the library. It's been renamed the Alice Louise Reynolds Women in Scholarship Lecture. This portrait hangs in the library. She has a room named for her in the library. Um, and one of her students, you might know this name, Amy Brown Lyman, who was General Relief Society president later, wrote a biography of Alice Louise Reynolds. So her impact lasted far beyond her uh, tenure as faculty here at BYU. So some of you probably know about her. A lot of you probably don't know about Miriam Nelke, for whom the Nelke Experimental Theater in the HVAC is named for. Um, I didn't know about her until um, I was first preparing this. Uh, she's not LDS. Uh, she taught at the Quincy Conservatory of Music in Illinois, performed out throughout the uh, Eastern United States, and she taught in the one-woman department of special elocution from 1900 to 1908 here on campus. Tuition was paid directly to her, and then she paid a portion of it to BYU in, um, for granting her use of a classroom. So it was an unusual faculty arrangement. She left BYU for San Francisco in 1908, uh, formed an Academy of Dramatic Arts there, moved to New York, volunteered with the Red Cross as part of the World War I effort, moved to Hollywood, taught speech and drama, formed per, uh, performance groups, there was a reading group uh, named for her in Provo that met in her absence um, that had regular, meet regular meetings from 1916 until the 1980s. Uh, an honor she listed as the most delightful and satisfactory honor that's been paid to me in my whole life. So that's, that's the theater that still bears her name here on campus. Um, someone else you may not know who had an influence here on campus was Leah Dunford Witso. You might recognize her last name. She's also the daughter of a famous mother, Susie Young, later Gates, but uh, she's Susie's daughter from a previous marriage. Um, she was valedictorian of her class at the University of Utah Normal School, got a bachelor's in pedagogy, much like Alice Louise Reynolds, studied at the Pratt Institute, and then went to Harvard, which is where she met John A. Witso. The two of them wrote and worked together for decades. She was head of the domestic sciences department at BYU, but then later moved to Utah State and the University of Utah when he had administrative positions there. And both of them were very much into nutrition and wrote several texts on LDS cooking and um, word of wisdom and health practices. There we go. Oh, and the old uh, Joseph F. Uh, Smith Family Living Center where the JFSB is now, they had a room named for her there. Leona Holbrook was the first female member of the U.S. Olympic Committee. She was professor of physical, ed physical education from 1937 to 74. Um, so that's, these are just a couple of highlights. Um, I want to pause here and say around the time she would have been on faculty with a handful of other female faculty, when Wilkinson, President Wilkinson came down to be installed as the president, one of the female faculty member or female faculty responsibilities was to prepare the president's house and make the beds for when the president and his wife would arrive on campus. We do, we do not have this duty anymore. I <laughs> never made beds in President Worthen's house. Okay, so. <laughs> um, there's many other early ones you probably have not heard of. They clustered particularly in home ec and in English, but also music and physical education and dance. There were several female, early female faculty members from the early 19th century. Um, there was, I think Connie will talk more about the faculty women's association that developed. There used to be a faculty women's group that was more about female faculty staff and wives of male <laughs> faculty all brought together until 1992. And then faculty women's association was formed in 1993 to bring female faculty together to discuss um, issues and provide support about tenure process, publishing, and so forth. And the Faculty Women's Association still exists and still is a uh, highly functioning, thriving part of the campus community. Um, I do want to 
talk a little bit about what happened after the 70s. So up until Title IX, um, the, the implications from some Supreme Court and congressional decisions was that how Title IX would affect um, the hiring of female faculty. And at BYU, the policy was to not hire married women with young children. And in, in practice, this meant not hiring young women at all because the assumption was they would marry and have children and then need to be released. So um, that was the policy until Title IX came along. Then they had to decide, were they gonna file for an exception, a religious exemption to Title IX, or were they gonna comply with Title IX? And there was vigorous debate, and President Oaks formed a committee to study what would the implications be, and they decided to comply with Title IX, that they would not use uh, marital status to determine hiring of uh, female, marital or maternal status for the hiring of, of female faculty. Um, these are the most recent stats I have. I'm, I, I'm sure it's, it's gonna be roughly similar now, about, uh, 20, about a fifth, a little more than a fifth of the faculty, uh, full t uh, tenure track faculty, I should say, adjunct faculty have a much higher percentage of, of female professors. But of tenure track faculty, there's about 20, 23% kind of fluctuates a little. Um, this is just for my own department. As of the hiring in 2016, a third, roughly a third of my department was female, and that was the year that um, engineering hired their first tenure track woman. And I'm not blaming engineering. They have in all of engineering across the country has a pipeline problem, but they were finally able <laughs> to, to find a tenure track woman to hire. But last fall, the incoming law school cohort at BYU was roughly 50-50 for the first time, a female male student. This shows you, so there was the hiring freeze, 2008 and nine in that era. Um, and when the hiring freeze released, um, I think these graphs kind of tell their own story of why BYU's percentage of female faculty remains at uh, roughly the same. It's, it's sort of at a replacement level. So that was um, assistant professors before tenure, and then these are after tenure for associate professors. And then full professors. These are stats from Faculty Women's Association. There we go. So I just want to take one minute and talk about spaces on campus where women are memorialized or present. Uh, Heritage Halls were named for women initially. I'm going to get back to that. The Amanda Knight Hall, which still stands, Nelke Theater. The Smith Family Living Center that was torn down in 20, uh, 2002 had areas, like I said, for um, Leah Witso, but also uh, a selection of other women. The Knight Magnum Building, where the new engineering building is, um, was named for two women who were sisters-in-law. Um, there are many scholarships, endowments, and research funds named after women on campus. And then there's Marigold Plaza. Does anybody know where Marigold Plaza is? Oh, one person does. Okay, I'll show you on the map. So Heritage Halls were all named for early LDS women, and they were torn down by 2014, and so all the new Heritage Halls are, are sort of associated with a hit church historic site, so they're not associated with an individuals or anymore. Um, there we go. So this month, I Googled to update this present, uh, presentation because I've, I've Googled for Marigold Plaza constantly in the last five years to see if anybody's ever posted a picture or ever talked about it. Because um, I had no idea it existed until I put this together. Um, this has appeared on a faculty member's Twitter feed that she took a picture of um, that there, some of you must have heard about this, right? A sort of gentle protest to, to tape up, where is the building named after me? As if that's a quote from female LDS scholars and leaders. And then somebody as a rebuttal had pasted a campus map that highlighted where the spaces named for women were. So I have a... There we go. So there's the map they highlighted. It comes from a FHSS um, magazine that had a whole spread about women at BYU and women faculty at BYU and the sort of history of women at BYU. And then they'd included this map. That map is accurate because it, it, you can see over here, it tells you the years those buildings existed. So I put it into present terms. <laughs> those are the physical spaces named for women on campus today. Um, and then Amanda Knight Hall's slated to be renovated and rebuilt while preserving the architectural features, so presumably the name will stay as well. Um, Marigold Plaza is not where it's shown on the map. It's actually just right here. It's between us and the 
Clyde and the Fletcher. Um, and then there's the Nelke Theater um, within the HVAC. And then there's, um, I did not know this, that the garden by the MOA is actually named for um, two women. I didn't, I didn't know that. So, so I have this map. Uh, so I, in some ways, I, whenever I give this little, this is sort of, it looks depressing for the status of women where 23% female faculty in 1808 and it's 23% female faculty now and the spaces named for women on campus have disappeared. Um, I don't mean it to be that way. I think it's just an interesting way to think about how the spaces and the, pres the presence of those around us indicate um, unintentionally, like things can escape from us that we don't intentionally mean to give a certain message, but they can continue to give the message. I think that's politics with a little P, right? How things get named, who gets appointed, that sort of thing. So I want to end on a positive note with um, Alice Reynolds' quote of greatest has been the advance made by women in higher education. We feel it is the future that is big with promise. Thank you. Okay, I will be talking about the Women's Research Institute and what led up to it. So with the second wave of the women's movement in the 60s and 70s and the passage of the Title IX um, of the Education Amendments in 72, the universities around the country were establishing women's studies courses and centers. This also became a discussion here at BYU and there were uh, people in the right, right people in the right times to uh, help this succeed. In 1975, President Dallin Oaks gave two talks in that year and <coughs> in the fall, and he discussed the importance of higher education for women in the church. He acknowledged that BYU had some deficiencies in meeting the needs of its women, uh, students, and employees. And it, it's interesting to note what was he felt were the deficiencies, textbooks and courses that gave little attention to the accomplishment, roles, and concerns of women, little research being done on women, sexist comments to female students, young women being counseled against pursuing certain majors, <coughs> and advanced degree and low, low graduation rates. Um, doesn't seem like it's changed <laughs> a whole lot. Anyway, um, this is President Oaks's quote, and he's just saying as a university, they, they would be taking steps um, to be more knowledgeable and understanding about the concerns of women and responding to those. Um, guided by insights of reason and the illumination of revelation and be better about counseling um, female students. Got my papers wrong side up. So in the fall of 1975, President Oaks asked uh, Marilyn Arnold, who was an English professor, if she would be the special assistant. And they organized the first women's advisory committee at BYU. And after deliberation, the committee agreed that, that there should be a center established. And the quote was, only with the Women's Research Institute, or center, or similar organization devoted specifically to gathering and disseminating information regarding women's concerns, can BYU meet its responsibility in the education of women? So um, they did establish a center, but they named it an institute. So it's the Women's Research Institute. Um, was established on April 5th, 1978. Um, and it was to essentially 
uh, gather, evaluate, and disseminate information important to women's issues, uh, Latter-day Saint women. And it was primarily a resource for information. The Institute was to take no official positions on, on issues of public policy. And so mostly the, the Institute began doing activities like gathering um, information and cataloging it. Uh, some research was done, but mostly it was gathering information. President Oaks asked Ida Smith, um, she was at the time in California, to come to BYU and be the first director of the, of the Women's Research Institute. So I'm going to talk about the leaders of the institute. Uh, and I'll just highlight a couple of things from each one. We can talk about more about them later. But she did have helpers um, look in journals, newspapers, et cetera, and they cataloged about 622 different topics. Uh, and then Ida began speaking to church groups throughout the nation as a representative of BYU and the Institute concerning the desires and needs of women in the church and at BYU. Um, she served on the advisory board for the student-sponsored women's conferences. <coughs> and then the next, she was, Ida was um, the director for five years, and then Mary Stovall Richards became the director in 83, and she was also there for five years. They moved the WRI, WRI into under the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, and they had an office in the Kimball Tower. Uh, they were authorized to do empirical research at this point. The goal that Mary had particularly was to establish academic, academic legitimacy and encourage original research on women by members of the university community. Uh, they became the sponsors of the annual women's conferences at BYU for um, three, three or four years. She was able to provide, uh, get money to provide grants, get a newsletter, various kinds of things like brown bag lunches. And then they, she and her helpers identified all the courses on campus that related to women. Then after Mary, Marie Cornwall, who was in sociology, became the director. And she focused on three areas, addressing gender issues on campus, encouraging research on women's lives and experience, and encouraging more writing and publishing about women. Uh, she obtained more money, increased money for doing research. They published several books from the women's conferences and established two fellowships. The major um, accomplishment during Marie's tenure was the establishment of the minor in 1991. She also started the uh, class introduction to women's studies and sponsored or co-sponsored many uh, conferences and seminars. So the purpose of the women's studies minor uh, to educate students in the findings, theories, and methodologies fundamental to women's studies field. And of course, women's studies has become a, a very important academic field across the nation. The women's studies minor here at BYU was um, sought to foster critical thinking and scholarship. and. Um, over time, they have in, we have increased the number of courses. I'll go on to Bonnie Balif Spanville came from Fordham University in 1994 to become the director of the Women's Research Institute. And she concentrated on scholarly efforts, especially research by the, the um, institute itself doing research in, um, well, I'm going to jump down to the fourth little arrow. 
they, they did research in three particular areas, women around the world, personal and public peace, and women and technology. But she also expanded uh, the women's studies minor, uh, published papers and a couple of books uh, from their research. Okay, continuing on, she obtained more money for research grants, began the Women's Studies Colloquium class, sponsored a film series, and um, continued the conferences and brown bags and things like that. And then the work of the Women's Research Institute was divided up. Um, the WRI continued research and minor and sponsoring lectures, and as uh, Amy mentioned the Faculty Women's Association, which was actually created in 1994. We had the big meeting in 93 about uh, establishing it, but anyway. Um, and then the Women's Services and Resources took on the duties of, of assisting female students. Then the WRI was closed in December of 2009, and the Women's Studies Program was established. And the Women's Studies program continued the minor and a lot of the same activities, but they were, it's now focused more on giving money to faculty to do research in the, on women in their own disciplines. So that's all I have. Okay, so um, in, the, in 2010, after the closing of the um, Women's Research Institute, um, Dr. Forsey, Renan Forsey was asked to head a kind of an ad hoc committee to propose how we would con continue with women's studies. And so during um, that year, for the whole year of 2010, um, Dr. Forsey led a, a this group. I was involved, Amy was involved, um, Heather Belknap, several of us who are faculty in global women's studies were involved in that. And then in, and we made a, um, created a proposal for a women's studies program to continue on with the women's studies minor um, after the closure of the Women's Research Institute. And in February of 2011, um, the academic vice president asked me to serve as the coordinator of women's studies on campus. Um, so I wanted to tell you that when that women's studies program is focused on the minor program right now, it's focused on students. I was asked to create a rigorous program, um, a rigorous academic program for students. That was my assignment, along with um, being an example of research in women's studies for all of the women's studies faculty <laughs> affiliates. I was supposed to do those two things at the same time. So um, I've been doing this job since um, since then, since 20 February and uh, February of 2011. We have now, when I started out, there were 40-something um, minors in women's studies. I think we have 104 minors right now. We taught um, two sections of intro to women's studies every semester, um, and we there, there were about um, 40 or 45 students enrolled. We now teach four sections of intro to global women's studies. Um, every semester, and we teach about 150 students a semester in that class. So there's been, a, um, uh, we've been blessed with a lot of growth over the course of that time. Um, so I want to tell you three stories about, um, three experiences that I've had during this time, because um, before there was social media, the, there was this, um, there blogs existed. Um, that might be before you were born, I'm just teasing. But um, <laughs> there were blogs, and there was this thing that we um, referred to in Utah as the blogger knackle. And on the blogger knackle, um, there were, a, uh, when the Women's Study, when the Women's Research Institute closed, there was a lot of activity about um, the loss of women's studies at BYU. People thought that w there was no more women's studies programs, that it shut down. And um, w uh, Mormon moms said, I'm sorry, um, Latter-day Saint moms said, that they were not going to send their daughters to BYU because there was no women's studies for them to study. And so uh, one of my jobs in, uh, in my role has been to sort of 
fight back, and uh, not in a mean way or anything, but to try to get people to know that we have a women's studies program at BYU. And it's still tough for me because we have students who um, discover the women's studies program in their senior year and come to me and say, if I had only known, I would be a women's studies minor. I just had no idea. And we're at all the new student orientations. We do the major fair every year. We, we try to advertise in a big way. We try to let everybody know about our activities. So I'm just now going to ask you all to be missionaries for the women's studies program. Let people know that global women's studies exists at BYU, that we're here, that we're thriving, and that um, this is something that everybody should consider as a possible um, minor and perhaps future major. I won't say anything else about that right now. <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to tell you these three stories. One is that every fall we have um, uh, we have uh, free brownies and an and open house in our office because we want to get people into the women's studies office to let them know about women's studies. And we used to be over in the JFSB, but we're here. I'll just show you a picture of that in a minute. But um, over in the JFSB, we had th the students come in and the faculty come in and they give out free brownies and they sometimes go out in the hallway and say, come in, we have free brownies. And so one of the students went out one year and said, we have free brownies. And there was a faculty member, a, a male faculty member from humanities who said, I don't want your feminist brownies. <laughs> so I, I thought that would help you sort of see the kind of thing we're up against here. That <laughs> um, we also have, um, I had an experience, when my daughter-in-law was a student at, at UVU, and she was um, in the gender studies program, and she was talking to some colleagues there at UVU and saying, now, in the women's studies program at BYU, and this person said to her, there is no women's studies program at BYU. And she said, yes, yes, there is a women's studies program at BYU. And they said, no, no, you don't understand. They don't have a women's studies program at BYU. It's not there. They don't have. You just have to go online and read. There's no women's studies program at BYU. And she said, there's a women's studies program at BYU. My mother-in-law is the coordinator. And so, <laughs> so I mean, th again, these are, this is the kind of thing that, that we're up against. Um, just one more story. We have a, um, and I'll show you, show you some pictures of this in a second, but we have a student um, honor society in women's studies, and um, the uh, often um, when we have a speaker come to campus who is maybe um, a graduate of BYU or something like that, we've um, chosen to honor them by making them an honorary member of the Women's Studies Honor Society. So one year we invited um, Claudia Bushman, who's a pretty famous LDS woman historian, um, to speak at one of our meetings, and I always start our colloquium meetings by saying, hello, I'm Valerie Hagstrom, I'm the coordinator of Global Women's, I mean, uh, now I say Global Women's Studies, and then I said Women's Studies here on campus, um, and I want to welcome you all to our Women's Studies colloquium lecture, blah, 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 and then Claudia Bushman gave her presentation, and we did the whole thing, and then the president of the Women's Studies Honor Society came up and said, we would like to honor you by making you an honorary member of the Women's Studies Honor Society. Thanks so much for being here. Afterwards, one of the audience members who had come on purpose to hear, who was not a, a BYU professor, a, it was a, uh, a woman from the LDS community, came and, and ran up to my student, and who was the president of Women's Studies Honor Society, and said, did you know that there used to be a Women's Studies program here at BYU? <laughs> I don't know how to fight that. I, 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 just, I don't know. I, I don't know. So I really need your help to get the word out that, this, that the program exists here at BYU, even though I do think that we've made um, a lot of progress. So I wanted to just tell you that we offer classes every semester, multiple classes that count toward the Women's Studies minor, including our colloquium course. Um, and we, um, we do this every fall and winter. We have a, a lecture series, and everyone is invited to, it's a one credit hour class. It's a great way to get your feet wet and, and learn about women's studies and the latest research in women's studies. We also um, do a fall conference every fall. This past fall, we did it right, some of the meetings right here in this room. I think you can recognize that. And we did, um, we did, uh, we focused on the bodies of women in, at that conference. Next, in next fall, guess what? We're gonna focus on women in politics this coming fall. Um, that should sound pretty familiar to you. We also do um, a big celebration every March for Women's History Month. And so we have a lot of events planned for this March for Women's History Month. And so you should look forward to more information coming out about that. Um, and this is a, uh, some pictures of, of our Women's Studies Honor Society. Um, I think that's the very first group that ever um, um, it were inducted as members of the Honor Society. We have induction tomorrow night. And I think we probably have 
do you, does anyone know back there know how many people are getting inducted this time? It's usually a 30 or 40 people at this point. It's a, it's a pretty good, a pretty healthy group. We also have a student journal that um, we uh, initiated, uh, I guess, five years ago, six years ago. We've um, published six, um, six editions of it. And so we have a lot of people who, um, students, student run with student um, editor and a student editorial staff. And then all of the artwork and, um, and articles and stories and poems in the journal are all students student work, so please submit things. Um, <coughs> we moved this past year into the Kennedy Center. This was a goal of ours back in 2010. We wanted to be global women's studies. We wanted to be associated with the Kennedy Center, and it didn't work out in 2010, so we said, okay, we'll just be women's studies. But now we're global women's studies. We've been here this year. We're excited about it. We have an office. The office is really cool. It has couches and all kinds of other cool things, so come in and see the women's studies office um, and be part of us that way. Since we've moved to the Kennedy Center, we've been able to do some other really exciting things like make connections with the Amar Foundation in London and we've sent, we just had our first group of interns come back um, in December, who um, three students who were able to work in this successful NGO there and we have two more students there right now. We're sending two more in spring term and two more in the fall. So um, look forward to opportunities to do that. And we also have created a brand new um, study abroad program in human rights and women's rights that will go this spring term. And that those are kind of the things that I wanted to tell you about and then um, leave a little bit of time anyway to open up for questions. So thanks. Okay, thank you. We'll invite our three presenters to come up front here. Uh, we will have uh, some questions. Normally what we would do is have a microphone over here uh, because this is being filmed um, and state your questions into the microphone, but because that microphone is non-functional right now, we will ask you to give your questions. We'll ask our panelists to um, restate the question before they respond to it. But let me get started, first of all, with a general question, and then we'll open it up uh, to, uh, to you. So um, perhaps this is directed towards Valerie, but anyone would be welcome to answer. What do we hope for the future of global women's studies at BYU? You sort of gave us a tantalizing hint there. So um, we have um, submitted a proposal to the University Curric uh -huh, Curriculum Council to create a major in global women's studies, and um, that, the, that proposal has moved through the Curriculum Council. They've all voted in favor of it, so that's so far so good, but it has to go through about four more levels of approval. And so we're working on that right now. So if, um, um, if all goes well, and we can sort of fast and pray for that, um, we're hoping that um, may maybe in the fall we'll have a major in global women's studies on campus. So that's what I'm hoping. Anything else? Great, thank you. Okay, please uh, raise your hands and ask questions. Uh, uh, let me just say, if you need to leave at 10 minutes to to go to a class or something, that's fine. Please do it as quietly as you can, but we'll, we'll go as long as we have uh, questions. Yeah, so the question is about whether or not some of the introductory courses to women's studies could be incorporated as general education courses. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Shall I answer that one as well? Sorry, guys. Okay. So <laughs> the first, um, the I our intro, in intro to Global Women's Studies does count as a global and cultural awareness course for, for, um, for GE. Another thing that we've thought about doing is trying to create, and we haven't done this yet, but it's, a, it's sort of like a, it's a dream, so maybe it will happen, because lots of dreams come true in women's studies. Um, we are, <laughs> we have thought about creating um, um, civilization courses, um, the first and second half of civilization courses based on women's civilization, so that you could take those courses and just focus on the contributions that women have made throughout history. And so that we think that might be kind of a fun, a fun way to do those, those two credits that you have to do in your, in your general ed. Okay, I don't know.
So his question is, um, given that recent building on campus hasn't named buildings after any person, it's just the life science building or the engineering building, right? Um, what are ways to, what was the word you used, to incorporate more uh, commemorating of women here at BYU when buildings are probably not gonna be named for a person, male or female, which is a great question. Because um, I've noticed that, right? That we, I, I called it the engineering building. It's not, you know, it's not the Clyde building, whatever. Um, so I think there's a couple things. Um, the tradition of naming at BYU is unusual anyway, because most campuses name buildings and rooms and things after uh, donors, <laughs> after people with lots of money. And here at BYU, that's never been the tradition typically. I mean, there might be a few spots of that. So. Uh, in some ways that means that could be interesting where buildings could be renamed, right? I told you my wish list, I'd like the library to be named after Alice Reynolds. Um, or uh, the other way though is rooms, lectureships, and there, there has been an increase of those. I don't know about rooms so much, but lectureships and scholarships. So in FHSS, there's an uh, endowed chair named for Marjorie K. Hinckley. Um, in Women's studies, when it was reformed, the scholarship was named after Emmeline B. Wells, was for research, faculty research. It would be interesting, though, to see if we could change. Those are named after, um, well, Emmeline B. Wells, famous 19th century LDS leader. Um, but Marjorie K. Hinckley is famous to this group because of her husband. And she was a fantastic woman. I do not want to take away something from her influence. Um, but it would be interesting to think about what the criteria we use for male or female names. For, are we trying to name after LDS figures that donors would recognize? <laughs> or are we naming after people who influenced BYU? And that might be a different set of people. Um, I don't have an answer about one of those being better, worse than the other, but I think there's other spaces that women could, if it's, if it's a conscious choice to think about spaces or lectureships, those sorts of things that can be, or endowed professorships, or things like that. Um. I want to just comment on this. Um, the Alice Louise Reynolds, because she founded the library, we uh, in the library much appreciate her, and we have named the auditorium after her, um, which it was no small thing mm. to get that passed all the way <laughs> up the, the line. But the auditorium is known as the, the Reynolds Auditorium in the library. Um, and we have, the as Amy mentioned, we have the lecture series uh, named after her. And that's probably one of the best ways to, to honor women is what Amy said already. But um, we have tried also asked about getting a statue on campus of a woman to, to balance Brigham and Massasoit. <laughs> the and, two and Mazur. And Mazur, the ones that we have statues of, but that has not gone well. <laughs> well it hasn't gone well yet. We'll still work on it. It's a dream, but it does cost a lot of money to, to get a statue, and it also costs a lot of money to wrap the statues every time you have a dream with the figure of you. So the question is just that I mentioned that there are more women who are adjunct faculty than there are in tenure track positions and she was just asking why that might be. Um, I will say in, that's in general in the US, um, that's not just here. The percentages might are greater here, um, I think, but the, that's not an unusual pattern. Um, and her question was, is that because of family and life cycle concerns? Uh, yes and no, yes, because um, so when I, my incoming graduating class at Berkeley, or graduate class at Berkeley was predominantly female many years ago, and they said at the very beginning, we have a leaky pipeline problem. Lots in the social sciences and humanities, the graduate incoming classes have been majority female, not 70, 30, but you know, 55, 45 kind of thing for 20 years. Um, but the professor ranks 
women drop out faster than men. And a lot of that's attributed to it's really hard to have two babies and get tenure in eight years, right, or seven years or six years, especially in a lab science or engineering where you're expected to be in that lab, you know, an unconscionable number of hours. Um, so some of it's that, but some of it's also how institutions were built for a single income earner with somebody at home to manage everything. Um, and so the institutions themselves are not conducive to family work combination balance always. And that cuts against men as well because men now we have different standards for fatherhood, for example, right, or marriage now, um, and different standards of what's going on in their home life. So um, that I would say that's an institutional problem in higher ed. Um, that's where gender and institu old institutional practices kind of meet up. It's not just because women choose to have babies. It's also what that means in the workplace. I will say, and Valerie said this many times, these are some of the most family-friendly jobs you can have as a woman, <laughs> right, have a lot of flexibility for child care, elder care, home care, and that's, that applies for men as well. But um, that's what's often the case. What's also probably the problem here is that adjuncts don't always necessarily need a PhD. They might have a, a master's degree, and so there's a lot more women who can fit in a two-year or three-year master's degree program in their 20s and early 30s, and then adjuncts are part-time. They get paid like indentured servants, but um, <laughs> they don't have any publication requirements, citizenship requirements, meaning all the admin. They just teach um, for far below what they're worth. But um, so it's it can also be attractive to some people to keep their their foot in the field. Yeah. But it's a mistake for women, for young women, women your age, to think that it will be more family friendly for you to be an adjunct professor yeah. someday yeah. Day yeah. than to be a, a, prof a professor, a, you know, a, what do we, a, a full-time professor. Because why? Because you have to work more, you get paid less, and you have no benefits. And no support. M and it, yeah, <laughs> my, my, uh, my life has been more flexible. I've had been, I have five sons. I've raised children, and I've raised those children. I, I homeschooled them. I, and I've done that because I had the flexibility of being a university professor. If I had been an adjunct professor, I wouldn't have been able to pull it off as well. So. Go to the back row. More of our students need to go off and get PhDs. Yeah. Do you want to take first stab at this? Um, well, uh, so okay. So the question is, how do we grow the female faculty at BYU? And so, and and Dr. Forsey said the truth. We need to get uh, our women students to get PhDs. And um, and I would also just say we need to get our women students of color to get PhDs. And, and male students of color. Too. Well, of course, yeah, <laughs> that would be great too. I, I, I will say, I will say really quickly what I noticed in my department, and I don't know, I don't have stats, but I'm going to say we we might be the most diverse department on campus. Don't this is a low bar. Don't get excited, um, because we're a third women, and we have, I don't know how many token, not you know minority sort of. Categories. They one, do two, better three, than the Spanish and Portuguese department, which is weird, guys. <laughs> I mean, Spanish and Portuguese, and we have very, very, very few colleagues of color. And, and so in history, you maybe have five colleagues of color out of 40. So it, when I say diverse, it, right? But, but one thing we did is we decided as a department this mattered to us, and we got the college to support us. And then so we just try to pay attention. We try to be very careful to not... We don't want gender or um, ethnicity or race to be a, that's not a job qualification, right? So, but you want to get your recruiting pool to be as diverse as possible so that when you're hiring, you're hiring who you want and who you need in that program with all the qualifications they need. So we just had to pay really close attention to our recruiting pool. And that means both those people who are getting PhDs, but that also means everybody in the faculty, not just women, not just people of color, have to encourage all the students who have the capacity and interest to go on, no matter if you think they're not the right race or gender for that field, doesn't matter, right? So it takes it takes male faculty members encouraging female students and students of color to go, because in all honesty in our culture writ large, local and writ large, white men have been associated with 
or I'll, I'll put this better, white masculinity has been associated with power and wisdom. And so a lot of, I, I, know, of, I know some women in this room who have jobs because a, a male colleague in my department was instrumental in encouraging them and saying it was gonna be okay when there weren't any female colleagues for them to, for those students to go to. So it just, it has to be a priority and not just to check what's the box, right? That, that, cause then it gets weird. Yeah. Can I, and I'll just do this to, to Dr. Belknap, just say that she had a woman mentor, which made all the difference, I think. The fact that she could see a woman who was married and had children who were, had a PhD made it possible for her to do that. So we need you to be the future mentors. <laughs> so um, my, my research is on the recovery of, oh, I'm sorry, that thinks. Okay, so the question is that she really enjoyed learning about the women in the history of BYU and feels bad that she ha didn't have the opportunity to know about them before and kind of learn this history and she's trying to figure out why they're not m more well known on campus, is that right? Mm -hmm. So I'll just say my, my, my research is on the recovery of w um, women's, women writers um, who've been forgotten. And um, I, um, I, I, there, are w there are all kinds of historical forces at play in this, but um, when I was a student here at BYU, I was told that there, and when I was a graduate student at the University of Kansas, that there was only one woman who was writing in Portuguese before the late 19th century. And I, I just believed everybody. Everybody yeah. believed that. That was the narrative we were told. And so then when I became a professor and decided that I needed to include at least one woman in every class I taught, token woman, I, <laughs> I decided um, that I needed to do some research and that has become my research agenda and I, uh, I focus on theater and there was this one woman playwright, one woman who wrote plays and poetry in Mexico in the late uh, 17th century, but it turns out that there were actually maybe 24 or 25 women in Spain and Portugal and the Netherlands and Latin America who wrote, poe who wrote plays. That's just the plays. There were hundreds of women writing poetry, hundred, hundreds of women writing stories and novels and letters and, um, and treatises. I can't tell you why they were all erased, except that it happens over and over again. Women get forgotten. And so it's really important to write women's history. History, <coughs> excuse me, most histories have been written by men, about men, uh, power and so on. And so it's not unusual for us to not know about the BYU women. And students, I think, are focused more on contemporary anyway, but I think there's there needs to be more, I don't know, advertising or something. I'm, I'm trying to collect and do some research on women at BYU. Hopefully, someday, maybe I'll get that out there somewhere, or some of us will. <laughs> yes. Great. Um, so I, I'll just tell you that the maj that I can talk to you about the majority of majors. I mean, the biggest numbers of majors. So we have a lot of people coming from psychology with into global women's studies as a minor. We also have a lot of English majors. A lot of people in public health, in sociology, in uh, Mesa. What other fields? Um, a few foreign language, a few history. What am I leaving out? Those are, those are our big areas. So, the, so our students, because of what they major in, tend to go out in those areas. Um, but I made a list recently, and we're gonna try to um, um, explain this a bit more, but we have a lot of um, students who go on to, to graduate programs in different fields. People in women's studies, with what minors in women's studies, tend to think about the public sector, tend to think about um, NGOs, and trying to figure out how to make the world a better place. So we have a lot of students who go into those fields, into social work. Um, but we have students who get PhDs in English. We have students, uh, we have a student who just graduated with a master's degree at the, from the London School of Economics. We have another student who's in Divinity School at Harvard right now. 
so there's a lot of different a lot of different fields. We had one student who went off to Indonesia for three years to be in the Peace Corps there. So there's a lot of different. I mean, it's a broad field, and so there's a lot of different ways that students in with a global women's studies background impact the world. Medicine, law. Yeah. Can I add just a short ad addendum to that? I would say even women's studies minor would benefit any corporate America job. Just to f so uh, this is a not a corporate America job, but I think this is something that applies. Uh, this week, I'm, so I'm in Young Women's in my ward. We're planning girls camp, and there's a uh, we're going to go at a Boy Scout camp, so it's slightly different than our normal um, shtick. And a member of the stake presidency is there because he's been at this camp, so he's he's sitting quietly, and then he's just you know offering some info if we need it about the camp. And he said something about the experience of the girls at camp based on his experience with boys at this camp, and every woman in the room is like, no, it's not, no, mm -mm. <laughs> that's not what's gonna happen with teenage girls. And he doesn't have, well, he has one daughter who's incredibly exceptional and is not at all a test case for <laughs> having a hundred of teenage girls um, at the camp. And I thought, and that's the kind of, th that the business version of that, right? He's, he's a great guy, right? He's the one saying, we want the girls to have these kind of better, you know, enriching experiences. In a corporate setting, if all his experience is as being a boy and being a man and associating with men, and in as good as he is, as much as he wanted to do something good for the girls, he missed the piece because he didn't understand something about the teenage girl <laughs> experience, right? And I, a women's studies minor, which now I'm thinking about uh, suggesting that to him, and it's funny in my head, but um, <laughs> <laughs> a women's studies minor training to just know how to work together with corporate America is, is it's not great for men either, right? It's a grind, but um, I think that I think a women's studies minor could influence any job you have because just the understanding of women's experience in history, and when you uh, any women's studies is going to talk about gender and you're talk about men and masculinity and the social pressures on them, so you're just going to have a better tool set for sort of what are the social pressures on gendered social pressures on people in this corporate room, and how can I use them better to accomplish whatever the goals are? So, so Dr. Forsty has a comment. Yeah, so the, the women part of global women's studies is the subject area. It's not the group of people who can take the classes, <laughs> right? So we do have male students in all our classes, and we have male, m you know, students, m male students who minor in global women's studies, and, um, and they make important contributions in the field. So the question is, uh, is there any sort of push to encourage men to, to study women's studies? And um, the one thing I would say, and then maybe you can ta add, is that we actually created a pamphlet. Of we have a brochure <laughs> about why women's studies is for men, too. And so you can pick those up in the women's studies office and pass them out to all of your male friends. We'd, <laughs> we'd love it. I was just going to say that um, with a lot of the affiliates and people doing research on campus are male male professors who are doing research on gender and women's studies. I just have one more question.
front. Oh. Did everybody hear her question? But for the recording. For the recording. Oh, for, for the recording. recording. Sorry. Um, uh, are, is there training for leaders, um, department chairs, or just faculty in general, male faculty, or women for that matter? Um, there's not a lot right now, but there is a group working. It's a subgroup of the Faculty Women's Association that's um, titled uh, BYU Women Thrive, and we are trying very hard to to get that message out and to do training, and it's happening from a lot of different areas, uh, Title IX, um, just we're having focus groups and and lectures and so on that address some of those kind of things. There's also a faculty center on campus that um, that does all kinds of programs for the faculty to try to help them in the different responsibilities that they have. And one of their main foci this sem this year is to try to deal with the issues that women faculty have to deal with on campus. So I, I'm hoping that that will trickle down to a mentoring and helping women students. Okay, well, um, I think we're out of time, but thank you very much. I'm sure they would welcome, if you still have a question, to come up afterwards and ask it to, a, ask it to them directly. But please join me in thanking them for a wonderful discussion. <laughs> <laughs>